title of my sermon this morning is End Times Prophecy in the Book of James. And uh, I want to share with you, you know, I, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room is probably in agreement. Maybe not. I'm not sure 100%, but I think everyone's probably in agreement. You know, we're, one of the, the stands that we take in this church, one of the doctrines that we believe is that we are a post tribulate We believe in, in a rapture that happens after the tribulation, but before God pours out his wrath on this earth. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time really getting into that, although uh, I, I am in a way because the, the, the passages we're going to be looking at have to do with the coming of the Son of Man or the coming of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing how well that doctrine just fits all throughout Scripture because it's true. I mean, it, that, that's the only way you're going to have it is when, when something's true. You don't have to do a bunch of mental acrobats and gymnastics to try to figure out how to get passages to kind of fit together and, and come up with all kinds of other weird things to try to make the Bible fit. It, it says what it says. It's very clear. But there's another thing, and I'm going to get to this kind of near the end of the, of the sermon, is how I think there's like a big overview of the book of James kind of provides us with good instruction on how we ought to live knowing that, you know, we are in the end times. We know that Jesus Christ is going to come back, and we know that there are going to be trials and tribulations and trouble. So the reason why I preach on this, and, and with the frequency that I do, it's not all the time, but is that we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. We need to be strong. We need to be solid. There's going to be trials, afflictions, tribulations coming, so we need to make sure we're ready. So how do we do that? We're going to get all into all that. And I think the book of James, just as a whole, does a very good job of offering preparation for the end times events that we know are written and are going to happen and that, that potentially in our own very lifetimes even will, will be occurring. Um, so let's dig into this real quick here. Verse number one here in James chapter five. The Bible reads, Go to now ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. So there's our mention of the last days, and this is talking about people who, and keep your finger here in James 5, we're going to come right back. Turn if you would to Revelation chapter 6. I just want to show the correlation here with the end times events. James 5, the first three verses we read there is talking about you know, people who are trusting in their riches, these rich men who, who um, are going to have miseries fall upon them and they're going to be weeping and howling and their riches aren't going to be able to save them because the, all the, the, the time and effort they spend into just accumulating this wealth, the gold and the silver of this world, the Bible is saying it's, it's corrupted, it's rusted, it's going to do you no good, it's of no value when the Son of Man comes back. And you, you, know, you have all these riches. You've been lying and cheating and killing and, and everything else um, in order to attain your riches that are going to do you no good. It's cankered. The rest of them is going to be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped together treasure for the last days. Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse number 12. We're going to see the similarity here referring to the same group of people. Verse number 12 says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Look at this, verse 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Notice how it mentions there the rich men and the kings and the princes and the people that are in authority and these great men that trusted in their riches and had all this wealth in gold and silver, now all of a sudden they're terrified. They're scared. Why? Because Jesus Christ is coming back. It's talking about the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? They realize finally when Jesus Christ does come back, 
There's nowhere for us to go. Our, our, our palaces and our towers and our bunkers and everything else that we've you know, invested our money into is going to do us no good. Go back, if you would, to, well, keep a finger here in Revelation 6, because we're kind of going back and forth. I'm going to show you some of the parallels here with James chapter 5. So keep your place here. We're going to keep reading in James chapter 5. And of course, what we already read there with the sixth seal being opened, all of those events line up perfectly with Matthew 24, which we're going to go over to Matthew 24 in a little bit also. But when you want to understand events in the Bible, I'll just bring this up now. You need to compare Scripture with Scripture. Or you want to get a full, complete picture of what's going to happen. You want to get a good understanding of, especially with end times prophecy, events that haven't happened yet. It's a lot easier to look at the Bible of, of, and apply it to things that are already have occurred. It's a lot easier for us, especially in 2018, to look back at the prophecies that were made of Jesus Christ's first coming because we can see a lot more clearly. Right? God's revealed so much more, and we can see how all of these things measured up. And even the apostles were able to see a lot more, and their eyes were opened up after the fact, after his resurrection, after everything happened. They said, like, oh, yeah, okay, this all makes sense now. But when it comes to the future things, we, we, we see through a glass darkly. But at the same time, God has given us a revelation God has given us the information that we need to know to be prepared. Now, do we know how every single aspect is going to play out? No, but we don't need to know that. We just need to know what God's told us about, but we should do our due diligence to make sure we have good, solid doctrine so that we can be properly prepared. Amen. We don't want to be lied to. We want, we want to know exactly what this book says. And when you start comparing it side by side, you're going to find every single time, if it's good doctrine, if it's true doctrine, you'll have zero problems, zero contradictions. Everything will match up perfectly. And that's what we're doing here with James chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 6. We're going to see very, very similar, or the, if not the same exact thing being described with the rich man being fearful and, you know, and the lamb coming back. So in James chapter 5, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. What this is describing is people who are being wrong, people who are being defrauded, people who are being stolen from, people who, on one hand, you have these rich people that have power and money, and they are taking advantage of, abusing, and even killing here people who are just. And, of course, we know that who is justified in the sight of God is, is someone who's saved, someone who's born again, is justified because they're cleansed and they're washed through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we see here this, this reference to these rich men who are condemned because they've killed the just. And it says, and he doth not resist you. And we're going to get into that in a little bit, too, just kind of our attitude and how we're going to be going through things, that our battle is not a physical one. It is a spiritual battle. And... If we are alive during this time of the tribulation when saints are going to be martyred, it's going to be important to know how we're going to carry ourselves and, and, and how we're going to be boldly proclaiming the word of God, not hiding in a bunker somewhere, but actually doing great exploits for the Lord. Amen. But also, there's going to be a lot of people who are just that are not going to resist and necessarily have this big physical fight or confrontation against the people who are going to come to try to martyr you, but are just going to allow it to happen, right? As Stephen did. Think about Stephen the martyr in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 7, when, when they came at him and they, were, they started to stone him with stones, he didn't pick up the stones and say, no, man, you're not going to kill me, you know, and start fighting back. He just called on to God. He, you know, the Bible says he, he looked up into heaven, he saw God, and he cried, you know, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So um, there's, there's a lot of that that's going to be going on, but I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself in, in the way that we act. I'm going to do that kind of closer to the end. I want to just point out here, just so you can see the similarities between Revelation 6, James chapter 5, and we're going to tie it in with some other passages as well, that we're having these same events going on. 
Now, the only other way you can say that, you know, you, you have two choices. You could either say these are completely separate events or they're the same event. And I think that it only makes sense that the more you dig into this and the more you see the similarities that, no, this is obviously talking about the same event. This isn't talking about multiple different events coming. Otherwise, you'd have to have some reason to think that there's a very significant distinction between what's being um, said in the Bible from Scripture. But let's keep going here. Um, so that was James 5. Flip back now to Revelation chapter 6. And we're actually going to start reading a little bit earlier, verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So this is talking about people being martyred for Christ, and they're going to God, say, God, you know, how long are you going to let this keep happening? Meaning they were killed unjustly. They were killed for the cause of Christ. They didn't pick up the battle. They weren't fighting it. They're saying, God, we're relying on you. You're our defender. You're our rock. You're our shield. You know, our, how long are you going to let this keep happening? How long are you going to allow your people to be slaughtered? That's what's going on in heaven at the fifth seal. And that's the same thing that's being described there in James 5 that we just read about the, the, the rich people being condemned and killing the just and they're not resisting. James chapter 5, we're going to flip back there. As I said, we're going to go a little bit back and forth here. Back to James 5, look at verse number 7. Verse 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. And we're going to see patience being one of the key uh, attributes that we need to have in order to endure, in order to be able to survive the tribulation that's coming up. And notice it says there, unto the coming of the Lord. And, we're, and I'm going to be going through, we're going to be looking at multiple passages that talk about the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, right? And all of these are talking about the same event. And that event is the coming of the Lord, when Jesus Christ comes back. And these are all New Testament references talking about the coming of the Lord because Jesus already came the first time. So this is the next time he comes back. Every time. I mean, it, it, to, to say that, oh, well, the coming of the Lord is different than the rapture or is different than the second coming. or is, you know, People have to, to, to create these very bizarre explanations for these passages instead of just accepting it for what it says. Instead of just looking and saying, okay, well, I want to know about the coming of the Lord. Well, if you want to know about the coming of the Lord or the second coming, then look up every time the Bible talks about the coming of the Lord. It's really not that difficult because it's talking about the same event and you'll be amazed at how well everything fits together. So in James 5, 7 here, be patient, therefore, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It's coming soon. He says it's going to be happening sooner rather than later. It's coming close. So you need to be patient, and you need to establish your hearts. You need to make sure your heart is ready. It's steadfast, unmovable. Verse number nine. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned, behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. Now, we just read in verse 7, he's talking about the coming of the day of the Lord and being ready and being patient because he's coming soon. And then in verse 10, he's talking about, well, use the prophets. The Old Testament prophets are your example. Look at how they suffered. Tribulation, look at how they suffered. Persecution, look at how they went through all these things. And that's your example. And that's your example of the patience that you need to have. Look at what Jeremiah went through. Look at how he was cast into the dungeon. And look at the patience that he had and how he relied on the Lord and he didn't waver and he didn't back down 
from preaching God's word, but he maintained the course. Even in the, in the harshest of conditions or in the roughest of times, the, the prophets that also endured great afflictions and suffered many persecutions, those are the examples that were given to of how things are going to be at the coming of the Lord. It can't get any clearer than what it says here. Verse number 11, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Why would we look to these examples if we are to be raptured out before any afflictions happen at the coming of the Lord? Why, why would that be? Well, how would that even make sense? Saying, look at the prophets. Look at the, what they endured. Oh, but you guys are just going to be, you know, raptured out before anything bad even happens at all. It doesn't make any sense. We're looking to those examples because that's how things are going to be at the time of the coming of the Lord. Just as in the days of Noah and of Lot, did those, were those good times for, for believers? The days of Noah? Noah, the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but that wickedness abounded on the earth, and that's why God had to destroy the whole earth with a flood, because people had gotten so violent and so wicked that God had to just take matters in his hands and just say, you know what, I'm wiping everybody out. Not the best of time, not the best of, of or safest of places to live in. I bet there's a lot of persecutions and tribulations going on at that time. And how about Lot? When he just had two angels come and visit, and the whole, all the men in the city just thought, hey, we're going to go and defile these people. We're going to violate them. We're going we're gonna to afflict them. And they didn't do anything wrong. They just, they just went into the land. No, there's going to be a lot of persecution. There's going to be a lot of suffering before the coming of the Lord. And that's what we're being warned about. And that's what we need to be ready for. Verse, uh, turn if you would to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. So, we're going to pick up a little bit now on how James 5 mentioned unto the coming of the Lord. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, in verse 7. And we're going to look at some other passages that talk about the coming of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4 is a widely accepted passage that has to do with the rapture, and, and as it should be, because that is what it's talking about. But people who believe in, in like a pre-tribulational rapture will, will also agree that this is a rapture passage, that that's what it's referring to. And again, I mean, I don't know how you could deny it, but um, we're going to see this, what, the, what phrase is used. Verse number 14 there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the, what? The coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up. The rapture. That is the event. And that event is described as the, the coming of the Lord. Not a coming of the Lord. That is the coming of the Lord. Wouldn't it make sense if we want to know Hey, when's the coming of the Lord? Let's look up the, the passages that talk about the coming of the Lord then and see everything that's going to happen. Turn if you to Matthew chapter 24 because I don't see how you can say 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is talking about the rapture when it's talking about the coming of the Lord. But then in Matthew chapter 24, when the disciples just flat out ask Jesus Christ in verse number 3, it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? Hey, we want to know when this is going to happen, Jesus, as he's there on the earth with his disciples. What's going to happen at the end of the world? When are you coming back? What are going to be the signs of thy 
coming and of the end of the world. And then Jesus answers them. Boy, <laughs> you think Matthew 24 might be talking about the coming of the Lord? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 clearly indicates that that's when the rapture happens. If we can just let the Bible, just, just believe what the Bible says instead of relying on what man teaches is just their own doctrine. No, this is the way it has to be because this is the way I was brought up. Let's just receive God's word for what it says. Look at verse number 8. Now, we're, we're not going to go through all of Matthew 24. You can do that on your own time. There's, I mean, he's answering, so he's giving a lot of detail. I'm going to highlight the portions that completely match up with everything that we've already seen in the other passages that we've looked at. Verse number eight says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Matches up perfectly with people being, being killed and not resisting, right? They're gonna deliver you up, you're gonna be afflicted, they're gonna kill you. Verse number 13 but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So there's, a, there's a, a passage there talking about enduring, getting through that time, having the patience to endure the tribulation that's happening. Now, I'm just going to bring this up, but you should all know, you know we, believe, we don't believe in a works-based salvation. Amen. This isn't talking about your soul being saved, that you have to do all these good works and make it through all these trials and tribulations in order for your soul to be saved. In the context, he's talking about the flesh. And that's very clear. Uh, I'm not going to get into that very much, but I just want to bring that up because some people, I've, I've had someone at the door say, well, I believe in a, in a, in a I think he said, what he said, like a Matthew 24 salvation. <laughs> that's literally like what he said to me. I'm like, at first I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? It's talking about like, you know, end times prophecy. And then I was like, oh, he must be referring to, you know, whosoever shall endure unto the end. No, that's talking about as you're going, in, in this time when you're going through tribulation, your flesh is going to be saved. Because Jesus Christ is going to come back before they have an opportunity to actually kill you. So you're going to be saved from that martyrdom. You're going to be saved from that, from that murder that people are going to commit against the saints. That's all it's saying. But anyways, it says he that shall endure. So there's the, the concept there of, being, of, of, of having our minds set to endure, to be ready to get through the hard time and the afflictions and, and to make it through and to be blessed to endure. Uh, jump down to verse number 29, of course. It continues on and, and he gives all these different things that are going to happen. Verse number 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see, what? The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They asked him in verse number three, what's the sign of thy coming? He gives all of these different events that happen until verse 30 says, and then now, Finally, you're going to see the coming of the Lord in the clouds. After everything else that happened. Does that match up with Revelation 6? Absolutely. We look at the sun and moon being darkened and, and, and um, the stars falling from heaven. Same exact description you see in Revelation chapter 6 at the opening of the sixth seal. It matches up perfectly. Jump down to verse number 37 there in Matthew 24 because... What's funny is that some people want to pick and choose which parts of Matthew 24 are talking about rapture and which ones are not. Yet, you're going to find consistently the coming of the Son of Man or the coming of the Lord or the coming of the Son or the coming of Jesus being used all throughout the passage. Verse number 37, the Bible says, But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Days of Noe, great tribulation, already covered that. Verse number 38, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The coming of the Son of Man. Again, verse number 40, then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. I don't see how anyone could argue 
about that being a rapture passage, right? There's one here and there's one left behind, right? Left behind. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a rapture. Well, okay, it continually references before and after this passage the coming of the Son of Man, the coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, but these other passages, that's not talking about the, the time of the rapture. Earlier in Matthew 24, it's not talking about the, the, the rapture. But this is. It's ridiculous. Verse number 42. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. So another thing that we're seeing here, and what Jesus is revealing to him is saying, hey, people aren't gonna, by and large aren't going to know when, the, when Jesus Christ is coming back, but you, that's why you need to watch. You need to be prepared. You need to be ready to endure because... It's going to happen, and it's going to happen at a time when probably everything seems to be going relatively well. And that's why he brings up, that's also why he brings up the example of Noah. Noah. Hey, people were eating, drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage. Life just continued on as normal. And then all of a sudden, boom, the flood comes. Now, did it come as a surprise to Noah? No, of course not. He knew. He listened to God. He received the warnings from God. And that's what he's trying to do with us too, is saying, hey, you don't have to be in dark. You don't have to be in darkness and not know what's, what's going to happen. I'm telling you what's going to happen so that you're not in darkness, so that you can be prepared, so that you can be ready to endure. So by and large, the world isn't going to realize that Jesus Christ is coming back. But those that know the Lord and those that know the, the word should know when he's coming back. I mean, not the, not the day or the hour, but we should be able to see the events that are happening around us. And especially when, the, when the, uh, the son of perdition is put into power, we know that the days are very short from that time forward. So um, let's keep reading here. Matthew 24, verse number 43. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the son of man cometh. Again, the coming of the Son of Man, mentioned there in verse 44, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. I mean, how many times? One, two, three, four, five, six. There's at least six references to the coming of the Son or the coming of Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 just spread out throughout the passage. And I don't even know if I caught them all or anything. I mean, I was just kind of picking out some main points in my notes here. But at least six times. Don't you think it's talking about the same event? Yeah. Yeah. Of course it is. Why, why would it not be? What, what indication is there to say that, oh, no, these are actually, he's saying the same thing about the coming of the Son of Man, but he's actually referring to just totally different time frames and totally different events. Why would he do that to confuse his disciples when they ask him a, a pretty explicit question? They didn't ask for, hey, what's going to happen at the multiple comings that you come back, like, like you kind of come back halfway in the clouds and then you come back again. No, he said, when, when are you coming back? What are the, what's going to happen? What are the signs? And he answers them and, and he uses the same terminology. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, I, I want to point out there's a correlation here. And the correlation with, the, with these end times events, because Luke 12 isn't some huge passage on end times Bible prophecy, but there's something to be learned here in, in, in very close vicinity of, of what we're going to be looking at for the, the coming of the Lord and the parables that Jesus Christ gives about that and how we ought to be ready. It also brings up riches. Now, in James chapter 5, we saw talking about the rich men and the, you know, the oppression of the rich and the, and the trusting in their riches. We saw also in, um, in Revelation chapter 6, the people who, you know, the rich men and the people that trusted in the riches in Revelation chapter 6. And in Luke chapter 12, look at um, verse number 21. The Bible says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. So he's, he's, he's giving us the mind and he's making a distinction between those who are always just focused 
about money and trusting in their riches and their wealth, and that's what they live for, versus the, the mindset that we ought to have. And the oppression comes from the people who are just greedy. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. When you love money, when you have that greed and you just want more money, that's, that, that is the, the root that causes people to violate others and to inflict harm and to do whatever they have to do in order to get more money and more power and, and, and trample over whoever they want to because they have that love of money. And that, that is the cause, that is the root of, of all evil. And that is the exact opposite of the mindset that we need to have. We need to be focused on the things that truly matter because the life is more than meat. The body is more than raiment. God knows we need things to survive, but you know what? We need things to survive and that's it. We don't need anything above that. And we could trust in God to provide those things for us and we could work for him and really invest our time and energy and efforts in doing what he has for us to do in this short, short life that we have here. So let's jump down now to verse number 31 in Luke 12. I just want to point that out now. He's making the distinction on what our mindset should be instead of being focused on riches. And, um, and again, you could read, I'm trying to not read too much of all these passages. Do it on your own time. Check it all out in context and get even more of, of what I'm saying here. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get through. I have a lot of material. So uh, verse number 31, the Bible says, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Again, just, just emphasizing, you know, the, the gold and the silver is going to be cankered. It's going to be rusted and corrupted. That's not what we should be focused on. We need to be focused on the, the treasure that's in heaven so that our heart can be on the things of heaven and the things of God. Verse number 35, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. Waiting for God. Waiting for the Lord. With patience. That's what we need to have. We need, we need to be able to work to to act or behave ourselves like men that wait for their Lord. It says, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. So we're ready for him. We're ready for Jesus to come back. We're patiently waiting for him to come back. Verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. So verse 37 and verse 38 are both talking about the coming of the Lord. Again, now in a parable form, but it's still the same teaching about how we ought to be ready and be watching and be patient and ready for the coming of the Lord. Verse number 39, And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to kind of wrap things up here, and, and we'll go through the overview of the book of James and how I think that all matches up with all the teachings we're seeing here. Primarily what, what, what we're getting from these passages on the coming of the Son of Man is not to be concerned with the worldly things, with the riches and the wealth, to be patient, to be ready to endure, to have our hearts established, and to be, um, just be ready to serve the Lord and, and endure the afflictions that are going to come. Look at verse number 1 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Bible reads, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. And you know what's interesting? We didn't turn there, but in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, with, it, it made the reference to the coming of the Lord, or the coming of Jesus. And then in chapter 5, it says that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So it's referring to the same day as being the day of the Lord. The coming of the Lord Jesus and the day of the Lord happen on the same day. 
And we see here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the coming of the Lord and that the day of Christ being at hand. Happening at the same day and saying, don't be deceived. And it's interesting. Verse number 3 says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Giving us exactly what we need to know about when these things are going to happen. I was just wear, I, I wear the, the let no man deceive you shirt. I got one of those from, from Brother Paul. And um, I, wear, I wear a lot. I, I love those shirts. Those are my favorite ones I wear. So when I'm just kind of out and about, I'll be wearing these shirts. And I've had so many people up here say, oh, man, I really like your shirt. But I started thinking to myself, I'm like, I don't think any of them even realize what the shirt's talking about. I think they just like it because it's like, you know, they're Christian or whatever, and they could see it's like about the Bible. But I'm thinking like, you have no idea what this is even talking about, the reason why I'm even wearing this. So I think I'm going to start like starting more conversations with the next time someone makes a mention of that shirt because it's so good. The, the whole point of that, that's why I love the shirt, is that this is so clear. And if anyone has any confusion about the rapture, my first place to turn to is 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Just all the terminology. Now, we've already seen all these other passages about the coming of our Lord Jesus and how they all match up. We're going to see the same thing here, but you say the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together unto him. How could that, not, I mean, we're being gathered unto him. Is that, is that not a rapture? That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Is that it, it could happen at any time? I mean, what, why else would this be in here about not letting people trouble you unless there were people teaching that, hey, it's at hand. Hey, it's going to happen at any moment. The teaching is there. That's what we see today, and it's, it's completely being warned against. Saying, don't let them trouble you. Don't let them deceive you. Because other things have to happen first. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his, in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So why am I going into all this? Because the Bible, first of all, because the Bible does all over the place. You can find prophecy all throughout scripture. And I believe that the book of James is a great high level overview of how we should be prepared for the end time. So I'm going to do a quick, and, and you could tur turn if you want to the book of James, the last place we're going to be looking at anything, the book of James. And I'm going to cover just a few highlights. Because in my preparation for the sermon, I, I was reading through the book of James and I was just kind of thinking like, wow, this is actually amazing. It's like this little, little, um, can't think of the right word, but it, it, it's just like this summary or whatever of, of how we ought to be prepared with chapter 5. We spent, you know, we, we read the entire chapter 5 talking about the coming of the Son of Man, and we build up to that in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I think that if you're looking for a way to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ, that we can take the advice in James chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, to prepare ourselves to be ready for the afflictions that are to come. That I think these apply. Now, there, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of teaching in the Bible. We should be doing all of it. But I think specifically, these things will help to be ready to endure the affliction to come. James chapter 1 first starts off teaching us right at the beginning that trials are not a bad thing. Tribulation is not a bad thing. So the first thing we get in our mindset is that there's a tribulation coming, but you don't have to be worried about it being a bad thing because it's not that bad. When we understand what a trial is for and what the tribulation is for, we don't have to be scared of it. 
Now, it's not, I'm not saying it's going to be pleasant. There's a difference between something being bad, right, and something being unpleasant. So the tribulation is not going to be pleasant because there is going to be pain. There's going to be anguish. There's going to be things going on that, that, that you, you may not want to go through, but having the understanding of, of the purpose of it will help you. So James 1, verse number 3 says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So that trial that comes, the, 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 the temptation that comes is good for you and it works patience. In, in verse number five, we're going to see that we need to have wisdom and we need to get that wisdom by asking in faith. So we understand trials aren't bad. We're going to be looking to just have more wisdom, to more knowledge, to understand more about what's coming in the end. The Bible says in verse five, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not and shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. God doesn't want us in darkness. God doesn't want us confused uh, about what's going to happen in the end times. He wants us to know. And he says, you know what? Just ask me. Just ask me and I'll give you wisdom. I'll pour it out unto you because he wants us to know. He wants us to have understanding. So just go to him with that and let's see how he answers. And, and I believe God to be true to his word in every single word that's written in the Bible. And then later on in chapter one, we see the teaching of enduring with hope. So we're, we understand trials aren't bad. We're getting wisdom. We're asking through faith and we endure with hope. Verse number 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So everything in chapter one up to this point we're seeing, it has a lot to do with just um, kind of our understanding, where our head should be at, planning for what's to come knowing trials and tribulations are going to come, but that it's not a bad thing, getting the wisdom and enduring with hope and knowing that when we are tried, God will bless us. God, you know, we could come through that trial. If we could go through that trial and, and, and get through it and endure to the end, that God's going to have great reward and blessing for us by going through that. This is all mental. This is all in our head trying to get ready and prepared for what's to come, getting, getting your heart established. And then he finishes up James chapter 1 by saying, hey, you need to get active now and be a doer. You're getting this wisdom. You're getting more understanding. Be a doer of the word. Verse 22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. That we need to actually start doing the work. James 2 then continues on and just hammers the point of being a doer of the work and not having a dead faith and, and helping people out and doing the things that the Bible says to do, being very active. James chapter 3 details then being able to, to control your tongue and your testimony and the things that you say. So we go from learning and understanding to doing to then getting even more control of ourselves, more control over the things that we say and the things that we preach. And then James chapter four warns us about the pitfalls. It warns about the lust of the flesh and how we need to take heed to ourselves and just be able to submit to God so that we can completely endure. We've got the knowledge. We're starting to do the work. We've got the, the, our, our mouth kind of you know, preaching the right things. And then we have to beware and take heed for the flesh, look at verse number seven in James four. The Bible says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Again, good advice about the temptations and the trials and tribulation that's gonna come. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That's another promise. Don't, you know, we don't have to be scared about the devil attacking. We just need to resist him. Just stand fast and he will run away. He will flee. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And this is all going to help you to become a strong soldier to endure the fight. Verse number 11, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. And this is giving the advice of not, uh, you know, that we're in a spiritual battle to attack the enemy and we're not attacking our brothers. Right. There's going to be trials and tribulations coming. You're going to want your brother close at your side 
to be standing with you to get strength from each other and not fighting back and forth between each other when you've got a much bigger battle going on. And we need to be careful about that. And I'm not talking about someone who's guilty of like a 1 Corinthians 5 sin that you're not even supposed to be fellowshipping with. I'm talking about just the stupid, petty fights and arguments and things that people get into that really are ultimately are meaningless or that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things, that we need to not be attacking one another. We don't need the infighting. We need the strength to endure. And then, of course, James chapter 5 teaches not to be distracted with the riches and with the monetary wealth and to endure the afflictions with patience and then to pray and to win souls unto the end. Verse number 16 there in James 5 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We, that, that's why we have our prayer requests. That's why we pray for one another. We need to be strong. We need to be strengthened. Trials and tribulations are coming. Get in the practice of praying for each other, caring about each other, and helping to lift each other up to get through the fight and to endure through the trials and tribulations. Verse number 19 says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And we're basically closing out James on that note. We need to be prepared. Knowing what the Bible says, getting the knowledge, we need to start acting and doing. We need to... Um, Control our tongues, control our flesh, support one another, and win souls unto the end. That is the, the, the plan, the, the, the sub-plan that we find here in, James, in the book of James regarding what we're going to need to get through the end times. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the great teaching that we could find all throughout your, your words. Pray that you would please just help us to be strengthened, dear Lord. Help us to to be active and to be more doers of the work. And um, Lord, continue to, we, we come before you and just ask you to, to open up our understanding and our knowledge of Scripture that, that we know that you'll give that to us. We just ask in faith and, uh, and not doubt, Lord. I know, I know that you want this and we know that this is your will. We know you want us to understand the things that are going to happen. Help us to be well prepared, dear Lord. Help us to be strengthened and help us to do great exploits for, for you and, and for the Lord Jesus Christ and to just know um, that we can get through any of these things uh, when we're relying completely on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.